The Lord be with you. Welcome to Grace on this, the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany, our opening hymn, 684, Come unto me, ye weary. We rise for divine service, setting one, page 151. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us. 
so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ. And by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We will speak the intro printed on your sheet, and we'll speak it responsively. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your just and righteous decrees. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Glory Glory be to to the the Father, and to the the Son, Son, and and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit, as as it was in the beginning, beginning, is now, now, and and will will be be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your just and righteous decrees. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, Glory of God the Father, Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray the collect for this day. O Lord, graciously hear the prayers of your people, that we who justly suffer the consequence of our sin may be mercifully delivered by your goodness to the glory of your name through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be seated for the hearing of God's word. The Old Testament, sixth Sunday, Epiphany, chapter 6. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. 
He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought. For it, is, it does not cease to bear fruit. This is the word of the Lord. We'll say the, speak the gradual together. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true, that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him for power came out from him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you, when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. This is the gospel of the Lord. To you, O Christ. We confess together the Nicene Creed, page 158. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. 
and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children forward. Well, come on up. All right. So we heard the words of Jesus this morning in the gospel reading, right? And there's a picture on the bulletin cover. It shows Jesus teaching his disciples. See? See that picture? He's teaching his disciples, and there's a great crowd around him. So not only the 12 that we sometimes hear about, and also called the apostles are there, but a, a big crowd of people. And you know, it says what Jesus did, that he healed those who were sick, and they came to him, and they were healed. All the various problems they might have had, maybe some of them couldn't walk. Maybe some of them couldn't see. Jesus could heal any of those things. And you know what? When we hear his word today, it's good news for us. Because like that crowd that came to him, because they could hope in him for help, we come to him. And we know he is our help. He is the one that, that makes us strong. He is the one that brings us forgiveness of our sins. So you know what? Look at this. He lifted up his eyes to the disciples and he said, blessed are you. Blessed are you. But then he said something surprising. Blessed are you who are poor. Yours is the kingdom of God. Well, that, I didn't really think of that, right? Blessed are you who are poor. But you know what? God gives even the poorest people what they need in Jesus. Everything that we really need comes in him. And so the crowd that was there that day, they were blessed because they heard his word. So for you today, you are blessed because you hear his word. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, bless these children that they may continue to hear your word. Protect them and their families. Watch over and strengthen them. In your name we ask. Amen. Hear his word. All right, then. Yeah. Zach, let's get some candy for you. All right. Oh, you can open that. Yeah, that should probably be the one we open. We have some special candy today. In remembrance of St. Valentine's Day, which is tomorrow. Gummy hearts, right? Okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, our hymn of the day, 394. Songs of thankfulness and praise.
made manifest. God's grace, His peace, His mercy be unto you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Sermon text this morning from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In fact, he says. Notice the emphasis. Paul's emphasis on the resurrection of the body of Christ. In fact, this is how it is. Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead bodily. He is raised with a body the disciples could touch, a body they could sit down and eat together with. He had been raised and glorified, but it was, and still is, a physical body. The incarnation of the eternal Son does not end with the resurrection or the ascension to heaven. Those two natures joined in our Savior, God and man, remain united in our Savior. So now our human nature is raised to the right hand of God. And that makes a great difference for us. Because as Jesus is raised as the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep, it implies then that the harvest follows. Remember in the Old Testament, the first fruits were offered to God as a thank offering, and it was an indication of the following harvest to come. So it is with Jesus' resurrection. He is the first fruits. You, you in Christ, are the harvest that is yet to come. And that is great, great news for us, because in Jesus we see first off our redemption at the cross, which is the means of our forgiveness. And secondly, in his resurrection, we see our future. We know that we now have a heavenly home, that he has prepared a place for us, and that those who have fallen asleep in Christ, that is, they have died in the faith, will experience heaven, will know the resurrection of the body. Human beings are not complete as bodiless souls. And this is a common misunderstanding even within Christianity. As if somehow when we die, we just remain a soul forever. We were created both soul and body. Body and soul. And in the resurrection, we are restored in perfection. Because the resurrected body is no longer captive to sin, or to all its effects, illness, suffering, death. But those Corinthians, oh, the Corinthians, and if you've studied the Corinthian letters, you know this is a congregation that has a lot of questions. In fact, the Corinthians are a congregation that have a lot of internal problems. There's no coincidence. Paul writes some rather long letters to assist them. It wasn't It seems only the ordinary problems a congregation might experience. But some among the Corinthians were denying the bodily resurrection. Now remember, in the context, the Corinthians are not Jews. Well, there might have been a couple scattered in there, but they were Gentiles. And as Gentiles, they didn't have the same foundational beliefs about death and resurrection as the Jews did. I mean, most Jews believed in the resurrection of the dead on the last day. Gentiles did not have that sort of foundation. Greeks, Romans, even Egyptians didn't believe in a bodily resurrection. And that error found its way into the congregation in Corinth. The common belief amongst the Greeks or the Romans or even the Egyptians was that a person's soul did live on in a sense, It would enter into an afterlife, but the afterlife was seen as a rather sad place, a place of shadow, even kind of a gloomy idea. Christianity brought the good news of real life restored, life made whole, life taken out of the brokenness of sin and death 
and restored to the beautiful life that God had intended from the beginning. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. And we grab onto that hope, especially when we grieve the loss of a loved one, especially when we stand in a cemetery in an internment. Because the word of Christ prevails over everything, including death. So the members at Corinth need some further instructions. And that's what Paul is doing in chapter 15. They've been influenced by the false beliefs of the Greco-Roman culture in which they live. Those beliefs including the idea that the body is merely a shell and that the real person is the soul. Sound very different from what you hear in your culture sometimes? A little different. We don't have the Greco-Roman gods around, but the ideas are still there. I bet you've heard the same sentiment. And these are false ideas. The idea that you can discard the human body as it's unimportant. But that was an idea that was milling around the Corinthian church. And if it was a problem for them then, it's still a problem for us today sometimes. And you know, the great Apostle Paul would have nothing of it. He would not allow such a gross error to have any place in the congregation. So he spends chapter 15 correcting the misunderstanding. It's sometimes called the great resurrection chapter. And it really might be a good thing for each of us to read the whole chapter during this week, maybe as one of our prayer devotional times. And to ponder what it says, because it's so very important. The resurrection of the body, which we confess in the creed, is not a mere metaphor. The resurrection of our bodies is real and physical and promised in Scripture. The resurrection of our bodies is future that will come. For the Lord keeps His promises. Listen to what Scripture says in just a few places in regard to the resurrection. First, in the Old Testament, the book of Job, we hear, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last He will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Job believes in the resurrection. In my flesh, even though it's been destroyed, I shall see God in my flesh, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. He will see with his own eyes his Redeemer. In the Gospel of John, chapter 5, the Lord says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. And listen to this. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who've done good to the resurrection of life and those who've done evil to the resurrection of judgment. All people are raised, but they do not all go to the same place. And again, in the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians, chapter 3, Paul says, but our citizenship, the place where we belong, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So the resurrection of the dead is a foundational belief of the Scriptures. So why is it that sometimes perhaps you doubt? Sometimes, you know, you hear these false teachers that talk about other ideas, you know, the, the body is just a useless shell to be cast off. Oh, the real person is the soul, and, and you're tempted to follow along with that. Why are we tempted by false teachings that denigrate the body that God created you? 
did God not do a marvelous thing as he created you? He did, and he means it for eternity. The resurrection of the body is real, physical, and it's wonderful. In the creed we confess, I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And there's that little cross that's embedded in the text, right? Why is that there? It's a remembrance that that's a suitable place to make the sign of the cross as a remembrance of our baptism. We remember our baptism with thanksgiving that God in that sacrament put our sinful nature to death and raised us to new life with Christ. And as we do that, we're also looking forward to the resurrection that we will enjoy in Christ. So the new life that you have in Christ, it doesn't end at death. You don't cast off the body like some useless shell. You will be raised. Your body will be glorified, made perfect and holy. That life that Christ has won for us continues. But the new life, the new life that you're given, it's not completed at the day of your death as your soul enters heaven. It's completed on the day of resurrection. But all of us have had those experiences of standing in a cemetery well, perhaps most, all of us. And you look across and you see all those headstones and you realize each one of those stones reminds us of a life. And we pray each of those lives were lived in Christ, but God alone knows. The cemetery is a sleeping place for the saints because the, those who sleep will be awakened. So we can't allow the false teachings of the culture or other religions to take away that joy. We confess the resurrection of the body. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. In a large catechism, Martin Luther writes this, As Christians, we yearn for the resurrection of the body and life eternal in the new heavens and new earth, the time when we will be perfectly pure and holy people, free from sin, death, and all evil in a new, immortal, and glorified body. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits, yes, of those who have fallen asleep. And you will be the harvest in Christ Jesus. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts, your minds, through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise to sing the offertory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your kingdom has been made manifest in the preaching and miracles of Jesus Christ. Gather together your great multitude from every Gentile nation and from Judea's remnant, that many may know wisdom come in our flesh. Lord, in your mercy, grant, O Lord, that your people may always hold fast to the word that has been preached to them and not believe it in vain. Lord, in your mercy, blessed Lord, we give you thanks for the wonderful gift of baptism and the many gifts that come with it, forgiveness of sins, the Holy Spirit, and the eternal life. 
through your Son, Jesus Christ. In your grace and mercy, preserve us in faith that we may never doubt your promise, but find our comfort in you in all temptations. Send us your Holy Spirit that we may renounce sin and always continue in the righteousness given us in baptism until we receive eternal salvation by your grace. Lord, in your mercy, God of peace, frustrate the desires of those who seek war, especially in Ukraine. Protect the people there from all harm and danger. Strengthen and guard the armed forces, including our military. Keep them from all evil, giving them courage and loyalty. Grant that in all things they may serve with integrity and with honor. Lord, in your mercy, preserve the family and all godly Christian homes. Give parents diligence and, and persistence in their duties to teach the faith in word and example. Keep all children in the promise you made to them in their baptism. Let the patience, kindness, endurance of Christian love have no end among us. Lord, in your mercy. Great physician, be near to those who are troubled by any unclean spirit, memory, or thought, and to the sick and all who need your healing or help, especially Joe, Chet, Thelma, Kevin, Diane, Eli, Bill, Bob, Stacy, Lisa, Sherry, Carol, Pastor Patterson, Steve, Kathy, Andy, Jesse, Connie, Pat, Glenn, Cindy, Diana, and all those who we now name in our hearts. Send forth your power in the name of Christ Jesus, that they would hear your word and be cured. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all who trust in you and come to eat the holy body and precious blood of Christ for the forgiveness of their sins in the blessed sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty Father, your Son is risen from the dead and has promised that he will only be the first fruit from among those who sleep. Preserve us in Christ Jesus with hope beyond this life. Comfort those who mourn with the certainty of Christ's resurrection. And let us live in confident expectation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We entrust all these petitions to your care, loving Father, confident in your great mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is worshipped together with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue the service at the preface, page 160. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to You, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world, you have made known to the nations in your Son. In him, being found in the substance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen our lord jesus christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us.
let us rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn, 923, Almighty Father, Bless the word. Maybe seated a couple of uh, announcements this morning. And that is on Tuesday, we have our middle school youth group at the Myers home at, from 6 till 8. They'll be doing a craft and such things. Also on Tuesday, our ladies' Bible study with the LWML, Tuesday at 7. Choir resumes for all our choir people. 
And if maybe you hadn't had a chance to, uh, to step in, this would be a good chance for newcomers. We'll be getting ready some, uh, already we've got to work on the Lent and Easter music. So uh, welcome back, Dennis. Good to have you back and get that choir back rolling. Other things uh, coming up, you can see uh, things for your youth. This year, higher things at Valparaiso, late July. Lutheran Valley Retreat, always a good time. That's the end of June. All the information's in the bulletin. So um, the Lord bless each one of you. I pray that we get this all finished up and we're in the building uh, hopefully by the 1st of March, maybe a little sooner. Uh, the inspections are set for the last week of February. Now, the inspections that really get you into the building are primarily the town of Parker and also South Metro Fire Department. And I say that with great gravity because they are pretty strict. And so pray that all those inspections go well because you don't get in the building until they tell you you can get in the building, right? All right. So the Lord bless each one of you.